Hi, I'm Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, vodcast or Facebook Live, whatever we're doing. And um, it looks like I have a microphone. I do. We had to do it in a different room. We were updating computers, and they didn't get updated in time. So we just uh, Plan B, which is why we're here right now. So it's great to welcome everybody. And this is actually our uh, second uh, Facebook Live of the new year. And um, this one is, I think, entitled What I Saw at CES. So here's my badge. Okay, I got official badge. You see that badge? Computer Electronics Show. So you think RSNA is big? RSNA is nothing. The CES has 200,000 people, seven or 8,000 companies. It takes all of Las Vegas. Just an amazing, amazing event. They also have really good things. Unlike medicine now where there's all these rules, I couldn't stay last night, but I was invited to this small concert with ringside table to see Ellie Goulding and Mark Ronson. Unfortunately, I couldn't go. Um, really nice things. And um, I did go to make the future wave maker, uh, which is uh, my daughter is at that company. And uh, sh that's why I have to g give that disclaimer. But I did go to, and I'm looking at the book, to some of their tours, which were incredible yesterday. I, for example, it was my favorite tour. It was... Um, the one on technology. So I saw all of the new 5G, all of the monster screens, the TV screens, curve screens. You can see I posted on CTSS the curve screen from um, the screens that were from Samsung, 213 feet. Let me repeat that, not inches, 213 feet. And it was so real that I started getting motion sickness when they were showing things on the screen. I um went on the first day to a session where um, they had three incredible speakers that hopefully I'm going to get to come to Hopkins. And I took notes, and I'm going to have more of that. But let me just tell you a little bit about who I heard from. I heard from Aaron Luber, who's the head of AR VR content at Google. I heard from Carl Bunch, who's AI technology leader at Amazon. And Andrea Bell, who's head of mindset at WGSN. And then I heard a panel where uh, Nicholas Carson from Insider was the moderator, and Sharon Profis from CNET, and Meg Goldwaith from NPR, and Pam Drucker, man from Condé Nast, and uh, Ezra Cooperstein from Rooster Teeth were there. So um, it was indeed impressive what you could see. And what was going on at the meeting. Um, there's no doubt we always know in medicine. And also, I got some good freebies. Look at this. They gave this thing that's like a water bottle. It was a care, create, grow. That's also from WaveMaker. It's really good. And then they gave you this free doggy bag. Look at this great bag you got. And what do you get in there? There was a candy bar, but I think I ate that already. And then you got this thingamajig, which is Avion facial spray, in case you get dry in Las Vegas. Then you had an aspirin for the usual. You had some vitamin C because you probably slept like 20 minutes. You had all to Altoids in case you got bad breath. And what else you got? Purell because you never can be clean enough. So that's the junk I got. But I think the biggest thing I got was a really good look at what is coming. And, and I did take a lot of notes. Unfortunately, I've noticed my notebook I have, I was sharing a room with my daughter, which means she was paying for it, her company, and I just took the other bed. But somehow or other, I took her book. So I got all her ideas. She'll probably kill me because uh, she's probably looking for that book. But um, I, I think that the things I saw, one of the biggest themes, and I think a number of people touched on this. So, you know, when you, all of you are working, you're using the computer and you're on the keyboard and you're clicking and you're clicking and you're clicking and you're typing. So it's basically a, a chicken, you know, plucking away. And some people are better chickens than others. They can pluck really fast. And some people like me are very slow. But... We spoke about this last year, and we had David Abitsky from Amazon here a few weeks ago, who was in charge of the chief evangelist for Alexa, how important voice was. And I was shocked last year how much voice was taking over. This year, voice was everywhere, and it wasn't just like voice for voice's sake. It became the process of how to do things. And then people also spoke about the fact that it wasn't just voice, that they, they basically said, okay, you had typing, then you went to voice, and I think I'm leaving one thing out, but there were four steps. And then the next one is gesture. So 
one of the things they're showing is if I want to move the screen up and down and do things, why do I got to type? I mean, you can move things around on an iPad. My grandson can do that. But the fact is that you need to integrate and be involved with technology on your level, not that the technology defines how you need to do things. And I think one of the biggest pushes there was the ability to do things everywhere and anywhere without you changing your life. If I want to send a letter to you, I need to be typing. That's not my favorite skill set. But if I could just speak about it or just talk about it, and then you would get that message. I mean, I can do a voice email. I know that. But that integration of sensory, perception, voice, tactile, is really where computers are going. And so it became very clear. And it isn't just you know computers for work. I think one of the things whether it was your car, whether it was work, whether it was home, the seamless integration that, no, I don't need to know how to use my Alexa or my Google Assistant at home and there's something else at work. No, 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 no. You did everything the same way all the time. That the computer knew you and the computer did the work. It wasn't like you were constantly learning and trying to remember the passcode or something else. It was the computers are the ones who are making your life easier. We always spoke about computers making your life easier, but usually that's more of a theoretical thing that everybody says is coming. I'm here to tell you that we're talking about what's here now. So for example, there was no appliance, whether it was a toilet, whether it was a sink, whether it was a bathtub, whether it was a shower, whether it was an oven, whether it was a refrigerator, that you did not control by voice. The fact is that you needed to be able to integrate. Now, one of the things people highlighted was the fact that companies are no longer forcing you to choose between Google and Amazon. People have their likes or dislikes, and they will constantly change what's better. But you, the user, could determine which one you wanted. So if you bought a Whirlpool appliance, you would just simply say what operating system you liked. And this way, you would be consistent across your entire uh, spectrum of what you did. You wouldn't have to learn two different ways of doing things, or you would forget what the code word is or the password. Everything is integrated in a way that benefits you. And so there's a lot of thinking about what does it all mean. People did speak about the fact that we need to get away from just looking at the telephone. People spend more time looking at the telephone look at their iPad than anything else. But I, I think it was this idea of, you know, how will your time be spent? So, for example, they were showing driverless cars. But the question is, okay, so now you're going to argue with me, is driverless cars two years or five years or ten years? The bottom line, driverless cars are here today. What you're going to see them is in controlled spaces. Maybe you'll be in museums. Maybe you'll be in parking lots. Certain things will have control before it's on, on the street everywhere. But then the question comes, if you're in a driverless car, how are you going to spend the time? Okay, you know, now when you drive, you pay attention, you listen to the radio. So I guess you can be in a driverless car, sit there. Which way do the seats point? Okay, which, you, know, who, you know, maybe there's four of you in the car. Are you sitting like it's your living room? What are you doing? Is it going to be you going to have a computer there and you're going to be doing your work? Are you going to listen to music? Or are you going to look at a flat screen TV? I don't know what happened there, but somehow... It said we ended, but we didn't do anything, so I'm back. So this will be part two, I guess. Um, and I was saying that one of the things we saw were the screens, 200-foot uh, flat screens where the things were as thin as a piece of paper, monitors or screens that were curved. Remember, the new iPhone, the new Samsung are supposed to be fold, bend. This idea about having a very fixed device that's very big in your pocket is really not going to be. This will fold down and you'll roll it around. Because now the material that's making the phone will definitely be different. So that becomes a very important feature. I thought um, also that uh, one of the things that became very clear is some of the technology uh, is not U.S. only, obviously. There are a lot of companies from Korea, China. Now, people did mention that there was 20% less Chinese companies than last year. Perhaps that relates to the embargo and all of the issues there, but we'll see what happens next year. But there were certain things that were amazing. So, for example, you know um, there are many programs that do translation. Google has an excellent program. So 
if someone's speaking in Chinese, it will basically say in English what they're saying, and then you could understand. But remember, there's a delay, and sometimes the words aren't translated correctly, but you can have a better idea than me trying to understand Chinese or Japanese or anything else. But Alibaba was showing in their booth that you and I, so I could have a conversation with someone I know in China. They're speaking Chinese. I'm speaking my version of English, and we're on a phone. So there's no delay. We're talking to each other. I'm speaking English. He's hearing Chinese. He's speaking Chinese, and I'm hearing English. That was extremely impressive because now the ability to, you know, analyze data, think how much data you have to learn, how quickly you need to be processing what I'm saying now and translating that into Chinese as I'm talking. You know, that's something you think about at the United Nations. People wear headsets, one person speaking one language, and people are translating the language. But that's a person, of a very highly skilled person, who's sitting there with you alone. Now I'm saying all of us can have that same capability. So Alibaba was there, very, very impressive. Uh, LG, the monitors were so impressive. Sony, Intel, uh, showing, uh, Intel was actually showing a lot of medical stuff, the OR of the future, where the interaction between the surgeon, the patient, the data, all became very, very critical. We also saw driverless cars, and of course NVIDIA was part of them. Um, and that became very, very important of what NVIDIA is doing and how they're moving forward in that area. But there were a lot of other companies. Bosch was one of them, uh, BMW, Porsche. So a lot of other, I think Lamborghini was there, some fancy cars. And I'll put up some more of the posts um, over Facebook over the next couple of days. Um, also to give you some summaries of what else was seen there. I thought that part was very, very critical. I mentioned in the beginning, and I'll just reinforce that when I listened to the speakers, uh, it was very clear that every industry is affected by AI. And really, you know, we talk about AI in medicine and how it's going to impact things and whether or not you need to be worried about it. I don't think you need to be worried, but you need to learn how to use it, integrate it into our practice because AI is coming and it's coming faster than you think. And so, for example, whether you're a company like Tiffany's that sells jewelry, how do you market to the newest customers? How do you explain things? It's not just like the old days where a store like Tiffany's might have all their diamonds and jewelry on racks, and then you would look at things. Not that I went to Tiffany's that often, but you would look at things. But now people want to know more about it. So you can use apps where if you're looking at a ring and a diamond, you can know where the diamond was cut, who, what country it's from, what the, the perfection is, what the issues are everything else. And these days, consumers really want to know a lot more. And so AI is allowing you to provide that information on a constant fashion. People talk about, you know, marriages of companies. So they were talking about how, uh, I think it was Whirlpool, one of the other companies that makes stoves, bought a company that makes recipes. Because if people want to buy your stove, and you're trying to say we have all these ways of cooking and doing things, well, then people want recipes. They don't, you don't want them looking somewhere else. You need to provide recipes and saying, hey, you want to make really good pasta, here's a really good recipe, and here's how you set up our stove. Tell the stove to do this, that, and the other. Say, make uh, Wolfgang Puck's uh, pizza with uh, smoked salmon on it. You get the ingredients, you put it together, and the computer will automatically determine what the parameters are to make that spectacular Wolfgang Puck pizza. I'll tell you that probably it won't taste as good as getting it in Wolfgang Puck's, but nevertheless, you will be able to do that. So I, I think that becomes very, very important as a way of thinking about things. Um, we always uh, know in medicine that things take about 10 years from the time it's in the consumer world to the time it's in medicine. I think, you know, there were medical stuff. There's a lot of medical stuff showed at the meeting, monitors. There was this one thing, and I can't think of the name of the company, but I'm going to post it online after. We you stood on it, it looks like a scale, and you looked at a mirror. It looked like a floor-length mirror, kind of like you would look at to get dressed. You wouldn't have any sensors put on you, but it would look and tell you your pulse. It would tell you your blood pressure. It would do an EKG in real time and give you a number of other parameters. So one of the things we saw is the ability to obtain data, collect data, 
and manage data for you. Now, of course, some people will be going crazy because every time they get an EKG, they're going to be worried and the blood pressure and the pulse. And, you know, it's going to be a change in how people need to look at things. The fact that you can measure everything 10 times a day may not be the thing you want to do because it might drive you playing crazy. And people who are just slightly hypochondriacs could have a real issue with that. And, and that could be a different problem. But the ability to monitor. So they showed monitoring patients at home. They also showed monitoring your cat, whether it's GPS or whether it's monitoring spatial functions of your cat, knowing when the cat needs to go to the bathroom when their bladder is filled so you can take them out. And again, sensors are doing all that. And you could think about they had the same thing for looking at babies, you know, things on the diaper telling you when the baby wet the diaper, which you probably can figure out yourself, or poop in the diaper, which you probably can figure out yourself. But nevertheless, everything was sensors and knowledge and information so that you could basically react to things probably in a more controlled fashion. So I was very, very impressed by that. I was very impressed by the companies and how they're thinking. The companies have put together really good talent on the computer side as well as on the usage side. So for example, they were talking about one of the car companies that now has partnered with Disney. Now they're not building anything right now, but it goes back to the point, what are people going to do in their cars? If you're Audi, should you figure out, well, we're going to have the Disney Channel, people are going to integrate this, people are going to learn a new language, people are going to do this, that, and the other. I think how we do things, what we do, when we do things, are going to change as technology changes. And CES was very good. I think um, Whitney will be writing a report for a company and her clients. Perhaps I can steal some of that information from her. But I think regardless, um, you can look online. I'll put stuff on CTSS, but you just look up CES. There are many different lectures and talks and things that were shown. Many different uh, articles speak about this. And uh, so um, anyway, uh, those are all important things to remember. Um, and I think it was very exciting. I think it's also good to go to a meeting that has nothing to do with quote unquote radiology, because I think sometimes we're always in radiology meetings, RSNA, Rankin Ray, all of these meetings, that are just so focused on what everyone else is doing, you kind of become a little bit narrow minded, or you think we must be doing everything you can do. And when you go to meetings like CES, you realize that you're doing things from 10 years ago, that the world potentially is passing us by in radiology. So we need to get the companies, the Amazons, the Apples, the Googles to really focus on medicine and really help us improve and not worry about those companies that have been around forever that are living off the past glory. And I won't mention any of those companies by name, but I think the opportunity for doing incredible things has never been better. And with that, I'll stop there, but I'll try to come back and do a few. I'm going to try to, I came back late last night, but I'm going to try to put my notes together, get some of the images and pictures I took and report back to you over the next week, and maybe I'll just do it when I don't tell anybody. Anyway, have a great day, and see you later. Bye.